Today's webinar is co-hosted uh, by the Global Diversity Exchange and the Ryerson Center for Immigration and Settlement at Ryerson University with the Migration Policy Group in Brussels. And together we will present My MIPEX 2015, which is all about measuring immigrant rights and opportunities. We have all heard, I think, about the war for talent as, as populations in many uh, countries age and decline. The United States, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand are in a healthy war for talent, as people like to call it. And, and this competition actually provides fertile ground for analysis, review, and evaluation. Enter the Migrant Inter Integration Policy Index, MIPEX for short, which looks at the immigration policies of 38 countries, has developed 144 policy indicators, and has engaged for eight years uh, in this research to present you with a scorecard that you can apply to your, uh, to your own uh, jurisdiction. And so obviously the question is, which country comes to the top, which country is slipping? Canada, for instance, performs well with some of the strongest policies in place. And the question for us here in Canada is, will we remain a leader as more countries enter the competition for talent? Will we be foresighted enough to learn from what is working elsewhere and, and, and reflective enough to take a look at where we are falling behind? To help us explore these questions today, we are joined by uh, Thomas Huddleston, Program Director on Migration and Integration, the Migration Policy Groups in, group from Brussels, and my colleague here at Ryerson, Harold Bowder, who is the Academic Director of the Ryerson Center for Immigration and Settlement in Toronto. Let me introduce our first speaker, Thomas Huddleton. Thomas Huddleton is really the man behind MIPEX. He coordinates NPG's research for European cooperation on immigrant integration indicators and policies, including MIPEX, the EU's indicators on migrant integration, and the European Commission's handbook on website on integration. He also chairs EPAM, the quarterly European NGO platform on EU migration and asylum. So with that introduction, welcome Thomas, the podium is yours. Thank you very much, Ratna. It's a pleasure to speak to people all across the globe. We have been launching the MIPEX results country by country, making each country's results available on each day so we can have um, national conversations. This is really our first international conversation to share with you some of the trends that we're seeing in integration policies across countries um, and also sharing with you some of the first evidence that we're gathering on whether immigrants are actually benefiting from the different types of integration policies that are being put in place. Now, for those of you who are familiar with MIPEX, um, you'll know that we provide a database of integration policies in various areas of life. We uh, have a scale that allows us to see whether policies are aiming to guarantee equal uh, rights, support, and opportunities for immigrants in that particular area, um, or whether they have many obstacles in place, in which case MIPEX is a great instrument for applying strict scrutiny to our policies and trying to dig out what were really the justifications and objectives behind these policies, and then were they proportionate and were they effective in practice. So the MIPEX uh, allows you to see at a very macro level whether integration policies in all of these areas are aiming towards uh, equal rights and opportunities um, or not. But you can also drill down into really the, the micro and you can look in each country um, at the 167 policy dimensions and see really what is being done on very specific issues. So if you go on the mypex.eu website, you can explore the data by going country by country or you can also go policy area by policy area and you'll see that we provide you with some nice comparative tables um, that we allow you to download all of the data. And on the 30th of June, we will make available our play with the data and PDF generator functions so that you can really go in and explore things micro and also share it more broadly. But we have also new dimensions to the MIPEX. We're not just comparing the trends and the differences in integration policies, but we're also monitoring statistics 
most of our data so far comes from Europe, but we hope to expand it to the other uh, countries in the study so that we can have more um, precise statistics on who is benefiting from each type of policy, who could benefit, and what are the specific types of outcomes that each type of policy tries to benefit. We find that often our integration debates are very confused. People try to ascribe to integration policies um, objectives and outcomes uh, that are not their own, that they cannot try and affect. And we see that people often have difficulty trying to understand whether their policies are being well implemented in practice. So um, since we have such expertise on how integration policies compare across countries, we give quite a lot of thought to how do we properly measure um, the potential beneficiaries, the real beneficiaries, and the policy outcomes. Lastly, this kind of um, benchmarking and set of comparable statistics are much farther than anyone has ever gone to try and measure the success or failure of integration policy. But of course, the best way to do that would be to do robust uh, quasi-experimental causal uh, evaluation uh, analyses, which allow you to really isolate the effects of a different policy. And we now have gathered together a database from Europe and from traditional countries of immigration of where these robust evaluations are available and what their findings have been so that we can say with the utmost certainty which policies are most effective for influencing integration outcomes. We're looking in eight areas. We now have a strand of health for those of you who um, know the MyFX already. Um, as I said, you can already explore these international results on the website if you go to myfex.eu under policies. But I wanted to just share with you my own uh, takeaway from the results. Now, we are covering all the major European countries. We have, over the years, through uh, great partners, uh, like our partners in Canada, been able to expand to the traditional countries of immigration, as well as Japan and Korea, other countries that are trying to learn from the experience of developed democracies. And um, I would encourage you, if you're thinking about um, what you can do with this data, to also go on the MyPEX website under the news section. We monitor all of the citations of MyPEX by uh, governments, NGOs, the press, and academics so that um, people can also learn how you can use this kind of international assessment, um, but also so that we can advance knowledge. Because since MyFix has been around for the past eight years, um, it has been a key instrument for multivariate analysis that's been done by researchers to better understand the dynamics between integration policies, public opinion, and outcomes. Now, for the results, here you see an overview of Canada's uh, scores in the eight areas in comparison to what we see on average uh, in the 38 MyFex countries. So again, these are averages that are looking just at our policy indicators. So they give an idea in each area whether the policies in Canada are tending towards equal opportunities uh, or whether they are putting uh, ob obstacles in the place of immigrants to participate in various areas. I'm not going to go into the Canadian results here, but I would like to give you um, some basic ideas of how countries generally compare. What we see is that um, countries that do have more immigrants, that um, have longer, traditional, longer traditions of immigration, uh, tend to have more inclusive policies on immigrant integration. But a lot of that depends on political will and on public opinion. So policies are very slow to change over time. Uh, they will usually change because uh, government has made a clear promise. These changes usually do not involve coming up with a new model of what integration is. But instead, it involves lots of small changes in different areas trying to repair uh, particular problems or um, provide a response to particular electoral promises. Um, so it's very dependent on uh, political will. We often see then that um, if uh, integration and immigration become highly politicized in the country, then also its policies become very changeable, much more complicated and, and contested. We also see that countries' uh, integration policies are highly related to uh, public opinion on immigrants. The more that the public thinks of immigrants as a threat um, and um, that they do not trust immigrants, uh, that they do not think that immigrants contribute to their economy, um, the more restrictive we see immigrants' opportunities become in different areas of life, whereas the countries that have more inclusive 
policies also tend to have publics that see immigrants as an opportunity um, to see their countries as welcoming places for immigrants to live um, and to think that immigrants should have equal rights. Um, now, there is no research that tells us wh what's driving what. Some suggest that it's actually policies that can have a very strong impact on public opinion um, by uh, informing the public about immigrants and then changing the terms that are used in the debate. Um, but of course, we also see that uh, public opinion can matter quite a bit on policies, particularly where the far right becomes a strong force in national politics and then in integration policies are changed, not necessarily to respond to uh, lived uh, realities in the country, but in order to serve the interests of the uh, far right. Now, I wanted to go through then and give you some of the results area by area, because I think this will make it much more meaningful for you. Um, what we see is that, again, in the traditional countries of immigration, in most Western European, and particularly in the Northern European countries, that uh, Im immigrant newcomers tend to be granted uh, equal access to the labor market, vocational training, education, and uh, access to, to social security. Countries are also improving in the types of targeted support that they provide for immigrants, and I will uh, share with you uh, some interesting examples uh, of that. So uh, for example, uh, top scoring Sweden in the area of labor market mobility uh, has totally reformed the way that it introduces newcomers to the labor market by making the public employment service the one that's responsible for welcoming and orienting newcomers and coming up with an individual integration plan for that person. So based on an assessment of what's that person's skills and work experience and ambition uh, in Sweden, then a plan is actually negotiated between uh, the public employment service, and uh, the immigrant themselves. And the immigrant then uh, will uh, commit to undertaking different types of training and support programs, which you see uh, on the right there in Sweden. Uh, things like uh, supervised work experience, uh, work-specific language courses, uh, particular jobs or uh, wage subsidies. And then uh, that um, plan will become binding for the person over their years, and they will receive an income benefit called an integration benefit that allows them to pursue these trainings um, even if they don't have another type of income. And these, these benefits also continue even if an immigrant finds a job. We also see uh, Germany improving its targeted support. So here you uh, see what you get if you're a newcomer to Germany and you want to find some information about what's available to you. Everyone probably knows about Germany's uh, integration courses that cost about a euro an hour and that are provided through the public authority systematically across uh, Germany. So it has a good reach. Um, it's now been developed and continuously improved, but it's also become much more flexible and personalized. So you can see that particular courses are available for women, parents, uh, young people, um, based on what are their family and work responsibilities. Um, there are also then uh, professional-based uh, German courses that are available so that people get the uh, vocabulary that they need for their job and um, get some work experience. There's also been advice centers uh, that have been opened up to help immigrants uh, find the right job and also get a recognition of their qualifications. And lastly, even a, um, a relatively new country of immigration like Portugal uh, can have quite a lot of political will, even despite the economic crisis. Uh, to continue uh, to treat uh, immigrants equally and try and invest in their opportunities. The High Commissioner for Migration, ACM, has been running for quite a number of years their one-stop shops, which have been recognized as one of the best uh, public sector um, services in general in Europe. And this uh, one-stop shop then brings together representatives of all of the relevant uh, ministries and services but newcomers can actually first go there to figure out then where they need to go afterwards. And immigrant uh, volunteers can then be mediators that link between the services and uh, immigrant newcomers who might not have the same uh, language um, abilities, might have particular questions, and might have particular problems given their country of origin. Uh, family reunification is an area where we've seen drops in Canada. Um, and almost simultaneously in Australia and uh, New Zealand, 
Now, of course, not to the same extent as the United Kingdom, where this discussion on the migration cap has then resulted in the least family-friendly immigration policies now in the world, at least the developed world. Uh, what we see is that, generally speaking, reunited families uh, get the same kinds of rights as their sponsor and a relatively secure um, resident status. Countries are also opening up to more modern definitions of the families by opening up to same-sex couples and to long-term partners. Where countries really disagree um, is what do you need to live together as a family? Many countries use an equal treatment benchmark uh, saying that what we expect of reuniting family members should be based on what we uh, require and expect and need if you are a family living in the country, meaning that you have to have a basic legal income of any sort to the level of social assistance, and you need to have some kind of basic housing, and you have to pay a basic fee like the normal fees. And we see there some great divergences with some countries then introducing many more restrictions that actually their own families and nationals would not be able to meet. Uh, an example, as I said, would then be uh, recently the restrictions that have been put in place on um, adult dependents in uh, Canada, but also in Australia and in New Zealand. So uh, here, a 100 would mean that the country basically lets um, applications come in from dependent parents and adult children. 50 would mean that the country restricts how it defines dependency and maybe only lets in people who are dependent for financial reasons or health reasons. Um, and a zero would mean that um, there are even greater restrictions so that the possibilities to reunite as a, with your parents or your adult children don't depend on really dependency, but um, are then restricted to become a channel only for uh, people with certain incomes or maybe um, only available on exception exceptional or discretionary basis. The area of migrant health policy is a new area in MIPEX, and we see quite some divergences across countries. The traditional countries of immigration, like Canada, tend to have um, very well prepared health services and policies to address any specific health or access needs that immigrants might have, and that's because these are countries that have actually developed the whole comp an idea of intercultural competence and trying to adapt to diagnostic methods and training and staff. Um, these, uh, this idea of responding to migrant-specific needs is very new in Europe. Uh, there are some systems that are responding quite well, like the Nordic countries or, or even uh, countries that allow a lot of regional variation like Switzerland, Italy, and Austria. Um, where we do see some big differences generally across the world is in immigrants' entitlements to uh, health care coverage, where there are often major gaps between legal migrants, asylum seekers, and undocumented migrants who not only face uh, differences in, in what are their legal entitlements, but also in the administrative obstacles that they might face to get the right documentation or to pass the right discretionary decision-making process in order to get access to their health entitlements. And, and here we also see some weakness in Canada, uh, like in the United Kingdom and in the United States. We, um, with MIPEX, not only look at whether immigrants become citizens, but we also look at whether they can participate in politics before they become citizens, as well as whether the uh, state tries to encourage new voters, um, new immigrants to become politically active. Now, what you see here is that Europe has a particular um, tradition of opening up political opportunities to immigrants before they naturalize, particularly the inclusive Nordic model of democracy, um, and also a country like Ireland or Portugal uh, has strong consultative bodies of immigrants where immigrant organizations can receive state funding to represent their interests, and where um, immigrants can also uh, vote in or stand in local elections. Now, these are not the only countries that have this strong tradition. The uh, English-speaking world also used to have this strong tradition uh, through, com through the Commonwealth. Um, but also through the history of settlement. And we then see very different um, uh, approaches to welcoming immigrants as uh, voters and, and uh, new citizens. So for example, we see that uh, New Zealand uh, maintained the, what was originally just for Commonwealth citizens, allowing them to vote in all elections and open that up to all permanent residents. 
So all permanent residents in New Zealand, after one year in New Zealand, can vote in all New Zealand elections. Uh, Australia maintained the, the right to vote only in local elections in some states. The United Kingdom has maintained that for all Commonwealth citizens at all levels, including in the recent national uh, elections. The United States has largely gotten rid of it, uh, as has Canada. But just to say that it's an interesting area, a very dynamic area, where often we see cities also taking a lead and uh, trying to argue that in order for them to represent all of their own uh, local citizens, then uh, local voting rights might be uh, necessary. Now, the other way that countries open up um, the, the democratic life to, to uh, new immigrants is through their access to citizenship where, not surprisingly, we see that the traditional countries of immigration have a relatively uh, inclusive and welcoming path to citizenship uh, for immigrants and some form of birthright citizenship for their children, meaning that for the parents, then, after you know, more or less five years, then um, immigrants can uh, take free uh, courses and take free tests um, and to, in order to become uh, dual citizens. Um, this approach was not so common in, in Europe, but now a lot of European countries are following these trends towards uh, birthright citizenship of some sort, um, dual nationality, and a short residence uh, period. And we've seen a, a lot of dynamic changes, even in very new countries of immigration, uh, like Portugal, um, uh, Finland, Denmark, and most recently Poland and the Czech Republic. And uh, a last area we want to look at is the um, at least that I want to share with you, we have a lot more areas of, um, that we've looked at in MyFex, but I had to be a bit selective, is uh, education policy, where uh, here we see that countries are generally weak, meaning that um, very few countries have a nationwide framework for how schools should um, provide access to immigrant children, target whatever that might be, their specific needs in the classroom, also sees new opportunities that immigrants bring to the classroom by, for example, teaching immigrant languages and cultures, reaching out to immigrant parents and new teachers of an immigrant background, and making um, mixed schools and making schools into a space for social integration and for intercultural education. There are very big differences across countries and big gaps. We see that the Nordic countries tend to have a very individualized approach, meaning that they will target the needs of any pupil and provide um, particular support, including immigrants and um, non-immigrant pupils. And we see that the traditional countries of immigration have usually done um, work to make their education system more inclusive based on their principles of multiculturalism. The United States uh, has mostly tried to create standards on uh, reaching immigrant pupils through its No Child Left Behind Act. Um, but uh, we see that this is an area that's relatively weak and also that this is an area where the general education system might be uh, as important or even more important than the targeted education policies that are put in there. Now, I wanted to end just to say that when you look in the MIPEX results, you'll see that we provide a lot of statistics also about uh, who could need these policies, who is benefiting from the policy, and what are the outcomes of these policies. Uh, just to say that uh, we do see that integration policies are still badly needed um, across countries. We see, for example, in Europe that about a third of non-EU citizens are not in employment, education, and training, and they very rarely get access to training or access to unemployment benefits. We, we see that um, many immigrants have now been long settled in the country, but they don't always actually have the kind of long-term or permanent residence permit that would give them secure status and equal rights. Uh, we see that uh, in many countries, the majority of immigrants would qualify to become citizens, um, but there are some big gaps in naturalization rates across countries uh, and so on. Um, there are some positive messages in here. We do see um, when we look at some outcomes uh, that, uh, depending on the country, immigrants are becoming citizens, are reuniting with their families, are taking up training, children are getting extra support in school. Um, uh, but there's still a lot that needs to be done, and some of this uh, also, as I said, will require a whole new approach to thinking about diversity in society. This last sl slide here on education 
um, is what we would think would be a really interesting outcome indicator for talking about the outcomes of education policy for immigrants. Here we compare the uh, PISA results on uh, math low achievement. So what are the share of children who end up as math low achievers? And we then compare how many immigrant children who have a low educated mother end up as math low achievers compared to non-immigrant children who also have a low educated mother. We do this control because we know that education background of parents is actually the predominant predictor of your education outcomes. Um, from a social mobility perspective. So here, trying to compare like with like, we do see that a number of education systems, at least by the second generation, are able to guarantee parity in outcomes, meaning that immigrant children with low educated mothers are doing just as bad or just as well as uh, non-immigrant children. Uh, for example, Canada, Australia, the United States, the United Kingdom, and then uh, to a certain extent, uh, countries like Sweden or France. But we see that in other countries, there are still some major gaps. So we hope that these kind of statistics that we are providing about the needs for integration policy and the potential outcomes to monitor will also help us to have more in-depth national discussions about how these policies are working out in practice, and then what other new policies might be needed, in which case MIPEX is an ideal instrument for you to use to explore what other countries are doing and to link up with the MIPEX partners in all 38 countries and get more information about how these policies are, are working out in practice. So thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to the discussion more on Canada and to your questions. Thank you, uh, Thomas. That was uh, fascinating, a fascinating look at how Canada measures up against others and how others measure, measure up against uh, uh, others in the pool. Uh, and lots of questions, I think, brewing in my mind, and I'm sure in the minds of, of the audience. But before we get to questions, let's have a deeper look at what's happening in Canada. I'm delighted to uh, ask Dr. Harold Bauda, the Academic Director of the Ryerson Center for Immigration and Settlement, uh, to present the Canadian picture. Uh, RCIS, or the Ryerson Center for Immigration and Settlement, is a unique university-wide research center and a leader in the transdisciplinary exploration of international migration, integration, diaspora, and refugee studies. Harold is a professor of geography at Ryerson University and has published widely on this topic, most recently as co-editor with John Shields of Immigrant Experiences in North America, a new textbook that provides the first comprehensive introduction to the contemporary immigrant experience in both the United States and Canada across national, regional, and metropolitan contexts. So welcome, Harold. The speaker is yours, or the podium is yours, whatever you may want to call it. Great. Thank you, Ratna, for, for the introduction and also for inviting me into the conversation and participate in the webinar. So what I'm going to try to do is uh, focus on the Canadian results, and RCIS has been um, the scientific partner in MIPEX and helped compile a lot of the, the information um, on the policy changes that occurred in the, in the last few years. And there have been a lot of changes, so it was quite a bit of work putting it all together. Um, let me provide you with some um, background um, in the beginning of this, of this short presentation. Um, Canada, of course, is a traditional um, immigration country. It has a long history of immigration, and it has lots of experience of, uh, with integration. And Thomas already said that this, is, this history um, shapes the outcomes of, of the index. But Canada, I should acknowledge, also has a, has a history of exclusion. Um, and that might be relevant in some of the recent changes, again, that we've been seeing, which uh, we'll get to in a, in a bit. The current population, the current foreign-born population of Canada is about one-fifth. So every 20% um, of the population, roughly, is, is foreign-born. Generally, however, there is a, a, a very positive attitude towards um, immigrants um, among politicians and the general public, and there are opinion surveys that um, that demonstrate the, the strong support for immigration in general. Um, and Thomas also mentioned the correlation between the MIPEX and the, the opinion surveys. Um, and I think this is important to acknowledge from the very beginning that as an immigration country um, with a strong immigration tradition, in fact, Canada couldn't be conceived without immig 
immigrants. It wouldn't exist in the same way that it does today without immigrants. So I think that shapes the entire context in which we need to interpret and look at the MIPEC scores. Uh, one piece of information that might be important also setting the context is that we've had a conservative government for the last number of years. Um, the conservatives have been in power, in, in power as a minority government um, between 2006 and 2011. And then since 2011, they have had a majority. Um, so let me move on to some of the policy changes. On this image here, you see um, the MIPEC score to different dimensions um, over time, and then some of the changes. Um, it looks like not much has changed, but you see some movement in there. Um, and I think the big news for us in Canada and elsewhere is that Canada has lost one point. And that is because recently Canada has undergone numerous um, smaller restrictions and changes, and that led to a turn into the, in, into the direction that we researchers knew that this is coming. But I think that is probably a surprise to, among, uh, to many of the international observers. And there are changes in particular in the category access to nationality, or in, in Canada we would refer to um, access to citizenship, um, as well as family reunification. What I want to do in the next few slides is just highlight some of Canada's strengths, um, the categories um, in which changes occurred, and then also discuss some of the weaknesses. So obviously the, the MIPEX data is too complex um, that I couldn't handle um, all the complexity within a short presentation, so let me just draw on a, on a few, few highlights here. Um, Anti-discrimination is clear, clearly Canada's strength. Um, all people in Canada, and that uh, applies to the U.S. as well, benefit from strong laws to protect them against discrimination. And there has been little change um, over time in the MIPEC score on this. Um, one of the areas in which we have seen significant changes um, is the family reunification category. In 2012, the government placed a two-year moratorium on the sponsorship of parents and grandparents. This moratorium was then lifted in, in 2014, um, but now we have a different and, and a new kind of system. The new system requires 30% higher minimum incomes from the sponsors of um, family members. Previously, um, a sponsorship commitment was 10 years, and now it's 20 years. And the sponsorships um, were capped at 5,000 per year. So these are some important changes that have affected the score. Um, and the government stated, oh, stated goals in, in this context was to protect taxpayers' interest and limit the cost to health care and social programs. But of course, the end result is that um, in terms of family reunification, it's increasingly out of reach um, for many families of low income um, background. Another area of change um, is access to nationality. Traditionally, Canada has had comparatively high naturalization rates, um, especially there's, there's research indicating comparing directly what um, naturalization rates in Canada and the U.S. and found, finding that um, the rates are much higher in, in Canada for various reasons. So immigrants in Canada tended to wanting to become citizens. Um, but there also have been reforms in 2011 and 2014 um, that introduced uh, changes uh, to the way um, immigrants can acquire citizenship. There are now longer wait times towards citizenship. It used to be that a, a person had to be in Canada three out of, or a permanent resident, had to be in Canada three out of four years um, to be eligible to apply for citizenship. Now it's four out of six years. Um, there's now more bureaucratic hurdles and uh, more bureaucratic paths towards becoming citizen. Um, naturalist, naturalized citizens can be denaturalized if the government deems that there is a security risk. And citizenship applications have become more expensive. Again, it raises the issue that um, low-income families and individuals um, are disadvantaged in this respect. Uh, this is now one of Canada's weaknesses, um, political participation. Um, in Canada, permanent residents have 
uh, no rights to vote in local and regional elections. And there's no consulting mechanism or structures in place through which immigrant leaders can inform local policy. Uh, I mentioned that there have been numerous uh, changes over time. So I'd like to um, draw your attention to two reports if you're interested in, in um, uh, the more detailed data. Uh, the first report was, was published by Maitri, the Maitri Foundation. It's called Shaping the Future. And it documents the changes um, between 2008 and 2012. And then there is a, uh, an RCIS report that picked up from that report and documented the, the, documented the changes from 2012 until fall 2014. And uh, I included here in the slides the URL, so you can just click them and pull, pull them up if you're interested. Um, I think these kind of, uh, this kind of documentation is important because not many people inside Canada realize the scale of the changes that have occurred over time. And I think internationally, um, probably in a similar way, uh, people are not aware of all the changes that have um, been taking place in Canadian immigration and integration policies. And many of these changes are in, enacted through ministerial instruction rather than legislation. And as a result, there hasn't been any real public debate on these issues and about the new direction of immigration and settlement policy which, which Canada has been taking. Um, so the losing one point might indicate, losing one point in a MIPEX might indicate uh, that there is a change in the warmth of welcome which immigrants receive um, once they arrive in, in Canada. So I know we don't have a whole lot of time, so I'm just going to um, wrap it up with with two conclusions here. Um, the, the first is it's important to acknowledge, I think, that Canada is still um, doing very well on the, on the, on the MIPEC scale. Um, it still leads the developed world in promoting rapid labor market integration, non-discrimination, and a common sense of belonging. But losing one point on the MIPEC scale raises questions about the future direction of Canada's traditionally inclusive integration policies. And I'll leave it at that, and I look forward to the, um, to the questions that you have. Thank you, Harold. Uh, very uh, instructive in helping us understand where and why Canada has lost a point. Uh, a point is, is, is in the grand scheme of things. Some people may think it's not a lot, but it all adds up to uh, a, a change in narrative. And thank you, Thomas. Uh, we now welcome questions from the floor, um, and the way you do this is you type in your questions, and our moderator, Kim, will be able to put them out uh, to Thomas and Harold for answering. But as the chair of this session, I have, the, I have the, the privilege of asking the first few questions uh, so that we can get going uh, on the discussion. So my first question is really to Thomas, and I'm struck uh, by the high scores of Canada on one hand and on the changing narrative in Canada on the other. And so this is a general question, Thomas. Are MIPEX indicators the floor or are they the ceiling? Can you explain what you mean by that? So when you say we are doing really well in labor market integration, uh, we get you know, a really high score. Uh, but we know that on the ground, uh, immigrant sure. skills are uh, not recognized. There is a greater, greater um, a tendency for recent immigrants to fall into unemployment and underemployment and precarious work. So how does this add up, you know, this, this, this reality on the ground with the high score? Are you, are you measuring? Uh, uh, so I, I guess the question is, how is the data collected? Well, no, I can, I can answer this question. Now I got it. Um, so what I think you're seeing is that basically um, some countries are responding to the situation of immigrants and others are not. So generally a country like Canada, um, at least in the past, has responded to the integration challenges that immigrants have and that immigrants will often have in, in lots of different types of countries. So you see that um, a country like Canada will respond 
by trying to remove obstacles in the legislation, by developing different forms of targeted support, facilitating the recognition of qualifications, creating bridging programs, creating uh, language programs, um, creating internships, and, and, and all of that. Now, um, you then get into a question of whether these policies are completely effective in practice where you have to do these robust evaluations. And we do see that some things uh, do tend to have uh, good effects, like getting your qualifications recognized, or getting um, work experience or a domestic degree in the country, uh, getting legal access to the, to the labor market, um, becoming a, a citizen or securing your residence. Um, we see that these types of programs are effective, so countries like Canada, when they implement them, we know that they're going in the right direction. The whole question then is about whether each individual program is always effective, and more important question, I think, is whether they're actually reaching all of the people who are in need and eligible, or whether the spots are limited and it's uh, quite a fight for those few who are lucky enough to get access to an effective program. Um, so for me, what that's saying is that Generally speaking, uh, it does set a bit of the ceiling. It says that Canada, um, in most areas, has very high expectations for um, immigrant integration and for what is the role of the state and society to try and improve immigrant integration, whereas uh, some of the countries that are very low on the index um, don't really see the situation of immigrants as a problem and where the state doesn't think that there's nothing really that it needs to, there's anything that it really needs to do. Um, so I would argue that by going higher on the index, you're not only putting in place um, higher expectations and you're showing your willingness to address the problem, but you're also usually putting in place the kind of effective means um, that can help you improve integration outcomes if you scale them up enough and reach uh, the immigrants who are in need. Okay. Can so I comment I, on this too, Ratna? Sure, of course. Um, when uh, when our our um, team at Ryerson at, at RCIS compiled all the information that is required from the Canadian part to put in the index, um, we became quite aware of the massive kind of changes that occurred over the last few years. Um, and we had initially an expectation that um, the Canadian scores would drop to the floor um, from the Canadian perspective. Um, uh, and we were quite surprised that the, in the end, there was only one point um, that Canada lost. Um, it was still one point, so it's going in the wrong direction, but we expected, frankly, a bit more. Um, and I think the reason for, for this is that we're comparing Canada with other countries um, that have a very different history. So in comparison to other countries, Canada is still doing very, very well. Um, and that relates to what I, what I mentioned in the beginning, that Canada has an identity that is very, very closely tied to migration and immigration and settlement. And they cannot shake the idea of being an immigration country and make a complete 180 um, degree turn. Um, so I think this is this is one of the reasons why we're still doing in Canada quite well um, in comparison to other countries. Um, but of course, there's a, a cause for concern that we're heading in the wrong direction, not necessarily what we where, where we should be going. Okay, I get it, and I I think there are, there are some questions percolating uh, in the audience around the same theme. But uh, what I'm hearing both Harold and Thomas say is that the mere presence of policies in this area uh, is an, is, seems to be a, a step in the right direction. So let's talk about policies as lived realities as opposed to abstract uh, pieces of paper sitting somewhere, because we all know that policies um, are only effective if they're implemented and monitored. Um, so. What are some of the problems, uh, Harold Thomas, that you see in, in this other question of measuring progress on policy as opposed to having policies that are simply not acted on? I think you're absolutely right that policy um, does not always reflect settlement and integration outcomes. Um, in Canada, for example, Canada scored, scored very, very highly on the, on the dimension of anti-discrimination, but from research and um, from anecdotal evidence, we know very well that discrimination still exists. 
And there's some great research done on, on the hiring process, for example, and how um, racial identities um, or racialized identities, um, accents, last names, and so forth, um, really play a role. And there's that, that strange category of require, that employers require Canadian experience um, to be hired into a, into a job. Um, and this is not really reflected. These outcomes are not necessarily reflect, reflected in the anti-discrimination policies that I'm in place. So I think it is important um, to, uh, to compare these policies that are measured by MyPix with the outcomes that are not measured in, in MyPix. And that can be done along all these dimensions, labor market policies, education policies, um, political participation, and so forth. Um, but I, my impression is that also um, MyPix was conceived as a tool um, to actually do that. So it would be the one end of the, of, of the comparison that MyPix already provides, and then it's up to the researchers to apply this and make the comparison with other kind of data that they collect or that might be uh, available elsewhere. Thank you, Harold. We seem to have lost Thomas, but we will carry on and uh, Hopefully, he can come back. But here's a question from Shehzan Muhammadi, uh, who asks, could both speakers, now in this case just one speaker, expand on how the, how the MIPEC scores and Canada's positions have different or similar results regarding refugees? Um, so Harold, over to you. Uh, maybe compare Canada's response to Sweden and Germany's. Is that, is that kind of evidence collected in the MIPAC scores? And if so, what does it tell us? If not, why not? So I'm putting you a bit on the hot seat. We, we can hold some aspects of this question. But tell us what you think, Harold, about Canada's response to the global refugee crisis, how well we are doing compared to others. Well, I'm not sure if I have um, that particular information, um, since it's really a MIPAC's uh, um, MIPEX uh, issue that is um, that MIPEX compiles. I know nothing about the scores in Sweden or elsewhere. Um, so from from our perspective as a scientific partner, we just collected all the information. So I really have know very little about the, how we compare to 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 other countries other than what's available on the line or has been available online since very very recently. Okay, I'm okay. back. Oh, there you are, Thomas. Wonderful. The question was, how does Canada compare with others in the MIPAX uh, pool on refugee policy? Ah, um, well, the MIPAX doesn't look particularly at refugee policy. We do look at um, uh, access to health. Um, so we look to basically see whether ref whether asylum seekers so those who are asylees, I guess, as you might call them. Um, we look to see whether there are conditions for their inclusion into the system. And then uh, also we, we look to see at whether when they get included into the system, they generally have uh, equal access into the system. And we see that there are very wide variations. Um, so for example, uh, Canada has come out with some of the most limited uh, entitlements for asylum seekers. There are only a few countries that impose so many types of barriers, like, um, well, Germany, um, although the government is considering to revise that, and then uh, Baltic countries, Malta, um, most other countries offer some greater uh, entitlements, particularly for those who are in different types of centers. Can I come back to your earlier question, Ratna, which was about implementation? Right, before you got cut yes? off. Yeah, sorry about that. So the first was to say just that most countries don't actually evaluate their policy, so we cannot say. Um, but it's also then quite worrying that in the integration policy area, we don't tend to work with experiments and pilots that would let us know that what we're doing is effective before we make it a general policy. And then that when we do make it a general policy, we don't implement it in a way that allows us to robustly evaluate it. But um, I should say that there have been more researchers who've been using MIPEX to make comparisons between policies and outcomes. And there are some areas where generally policies are determinant. So uh, citizenship policies will pretty much determine whether immigrants can become citizens. Um, we also see strong correlations with whether they can reunite with their family, whether they can become permanent residents. Um, we see very strong relationship between the strength of a country's anti-discrimination law and the level of public awareness 
of uh, discrimination. And we also see some relationships between, let's say, um, how ambitious are your targeted employment education policies, and then how many immigrants are taking up uh, these kinds of extra support in practice. So we're starting to get there. Um, I just think that the, um, the major challenge, I think, is trying to know where our policies are effective in areas like employment, education, or uh, social areas, because here, policy is not what gets you a job or gets you an education or uh, gets you a social network. Actually, that's you know society. And so policy can only be one small, specific factor. And it's really in these areas that we need a lot more evaluations. And in other areas where we know that it's pretty much policy that determines things, we should instead work with more of an evidence-based approach and pilot and experiment things before uh, we then roll them out. Um. Okay, so on that note, we have a question from Leslie Seidel, who is very active on the, on, on the comments. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, and his question is to MyPex, on labor market mobility, how do you factor in obstacles to the recognition of credentials acquired in another country? This is a big topic in Canada. You know, some of us wonder at the high score on labor market integration when we know that obstacles to credential, credentials and uh, international work experience are persistent in this country. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, so basically, we can only have a few indicators there. We look at whether there is a general attempt to guarantee equal treatment for those who are going um, through uh, professional and academic qualification recognition, and whether there is a single procedure for also the recognition of professional skills, so not just uh, qualifications. And then we look to see at also whether there is a kind of one-stop shop approach with one body where you can submit the application um, and get all the information that you need. And that there's also across the country um, requirements to try and um, uh, shorten the times and uh, harmonize the, the procedures. So I think what you can see from uh, the MyPEX improvement in Canada is that Canada is trying to address this. The same is true in uh, Germany. Um, and this is, I can tell you, a very new topic where most countries don't even go in and try and touch. I think that if you want to then, again, in this kind of area, look at what the obstacles are, you're going to have to go more into not necessarily what policy is doing, but also what all of the credentialing bodies are doing, what different regulated professions are doing, what's being done in different regions. Because it's these types of actors where you're going to find probably more of the, of the obstacles. Thanks for that, but I, I think what we are hearing in the room is it would be really terrific if MyPEX included its lens on policy to include uh, a deeper dive on credentialing and international work experience. So this is just a recommendation, and I'm sure you hear many of those to expand your work. So here we are adding to that. L let me ask a completely different question of both Harold and Leslie, uh, sorry, Harold and Thomas. Uh, and, and, and what do the trends tell us? Uh, we know that Canada has dropped a point, and Harold has, uh, has talked a little bit about a trend, if it's one. Uh, are there other trends internationally, Thomas, that you are, that you have, that have emerged? I mean, who's rising, and why? And who else is falling, and why? Or can we conclude, because this is part of the the global kind of narrative that Canada, Australia, and New Zealand march in lockstep almost. So if we're falling, so are they. Is that true? Yes, no? Well, I would say one. So first point that may be interesting for Canada, Canadian practitioners is I think that um, uh, government in Canada does learn from other countries. Um, Canada is often in close discussion with uh, partners in Australia, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, uh, the United States, um, and then to a certain extent to, to other countries. So Canada is out there learning from other countries, and I found it very striking that almost within the same year, um, governments in these countries um, all uh, restricted the access for adult parents. So Australia, and New Zealand to a less extent, the United Kingdom, and, and Canada. So I, I do think that uh, Canadian practitioners should look to what's going on in other countries uh, for the good and the bad, um, and to learn from how, what's been the experience in those countries of these uh, policies, because actually by looking at other contexts, 
you might already gather some useful evidence that will let you know what might be the impacts um, of these policies in other countries. And then um, second of all, and there are some trends. I think that Canada, um, like the traditional countries of immigration, is still a trend setter. Um, I do think that uh, in Europe, um, we have seen Germany rising as a trendsetter, along with the uh, Nordic countries. In uh, southern Europe, Portugal continues to invest in integration and look, come up with rather innovative practices. And that's been a very useful model for southern European countries and central European countries that don't have the same kinds of, of means. And I think that one of the key um, drivers of all of this continues to be public opinion and political will, which makes this a very volatile area of policy. So uh, a country like uh, Germany on MIPEX continues to make slow but steady progress as policies change based on extensive consultation, um, consensus between political parties, and then a commitment to not only passing that legislation, but explaining that legislation, and when it works, uh, standing up and defending it, as we've seen recently in Germany with the uh, rise of the extreme uh, right uh, movements in certain areas. Whereas other countries, I take as my comparison here, the United Kingdom, um, have politicized uh, all issues related to immigrants to such an extent, um, particularly responding to a small anti-immigrant uh, pocket in the population, um, that all of a sudden actually all things about integration become just about how many immigrants are going to be let in. Um, and even issues like citizenship or permanent residence um, or health care are only seen from an immigration angle and not from an integration and social inclusion uh, angle. And then the concern is that once it becomes so politicized that uh, all of a sudden you get rid of a lot of programs which were actually quite uh, successful. Um, you don't even then uh, have such high standards for integration and the, the state steps away and uh, you're just left with whatever your society can or cannot uh, produce. So there are some very worrying uh, dynamics um, that are largely political uh, dynamics. Um, I can't say how the, that will shape up in the future for Canada or for the other traditional countries of immigration. Um, from, Thank you. From Harold, if I may, we have time for one question, and it's okay. coming to you. Okay. One final question, and it's from Sangeeta Subramaniam in Vancouver, who asks whether MIPAX and the Canada report looks at the rights of temporary workers uh, versus permanent residents um, and pathways to permanency. How does Canada score in this, or is this at all scored in the, in the MIPAX report? And, and what can you tell us about this, Harold? Uh, how, uh, Thomas will be able to answer the question about how the score is developed and whether what the role temporary foreign workers play in this. Um, of course, in Canada, that has been a, a rising issue. The number of temporary foreign workers has been increasing. Um, and this has been uh, a great concern, or should be a great concern, I think. And they're never treated as permanent immigrants or permanent residents. So integration in that sense for permanent, uh, for temporary foreign workers and temporary residents isn't really an issue. So it's, it's really sidestepping the, the integration kind of debate, I think. But the whole trend of increasing temporary foreign workers, I think, is, is quite worrying. Thank you. Um, I'm, we are sadly coming uh, to uh, the end of our conversation. There are so many questions we could get to. But let me wrap up a little and give you both a sense of where I think the audience would like MIPEX to go further. Uh, and maybe you can take that back to the powers that be. Um, so uh, I, I think I've heard lots of people say in this uh, conversation that MIPEX should look more at credential recognition as a policy area to measure and, and, and uh, compare across so that we can actually think about uh, learning from others in this area. Uh, I said to Thomas earlier, I'll say this again publicly, I think leaving entrepreneurship out of this mix uh, is, is, uh, it should, needs to be addressed. And finally, I will say, um, even though MIPAX uh, measures um, policy at the national level, we know that uh, immigration and settlement and integration is, is, uh, is sticks um, and, and is articulated best at the local level. So here's a question to both Thomas and Harold. Can we look forward to a local 
uh, indicator set uh, about uh, local integration. So with that, let me thank both our speakers. Uh, really wonderful. I wish we had more time, and maybe we should ask uh, the organizers to make these global seminars a maybe longer, an hour and a half. There will be an evaluation sent out. Please tell us how we did, what we could do better. Please also uh, let us know if you have uh, any ideas for future subjects that we should expand on and host. Coming up in July, we will have uh, a webinar, we hope, on global uh, refugee trends and governance and language with the World Bank and others. Uh, and my last question is, is back to, uh, to Harold and Thomas. Uh, first to Thomas, what's your next move, Thomas? What's the big idea that you have? <laughs> well, um, besides uh, continuing to expand MyPEX in all of these ways and giving people what they need in order to improve integration policies, um, that is a top priority. But I do also think that um, a challenge uh, for a think tank like MPG and also I think uh, for GDX is to think about how we can best work to transfer best practices uh, across contexts and across borders where we can find people who are really committed um, to implementing a good idea and then we can go out and find where that good idea has has been implemented and been extremely effective really well. I see that from my work, there's a lot of great stuff going on across contexts, but people often have a lot of difficulty to translate what's going on from one context to uh, another. Thank you, Thomas. And your, big, your next big move, Harold, big idea. I think in the context of the discussion that we had, I think it's just important to document the changes that are occurring and are still ongoing. Since that report, there have been numerous other changes and policies, um, and try to uh, create a public debate around this that we are currently not having and raise awareness um, so that it does enter the public debate, even in the context of, a, of an upcoming election, federal election. I think this would be important. Um, that the Canadian public and internationally people know about um, the changes and how massive these changes are, even though if even though it just seems to be one point, I think it is significant. Thank you all. Thank you to our speakers, Thomas Huddleston and Harold Bowder. Thank you to the audience for being so actively engaged uh, on, in the chat rooms. Um, let me thank you for, for participating in this. Today's event is co-hosted with RCIS and GDX and MPG, figure that out, alphabet soup, everybody, where we all believe that diversity drives prosperity because when immigrants prosper, we all do.